whatever you well, hello dr bohm it's great to have you on the podcast today really appreciate your time and i'm super excited for our conversation oh aaron it's great to be with you and all your listeners thank you so much for having me yeah so for the listeners i mean these are questions that i actually get a lot especially um on social media when I do like Q and A's, I get a lot of questions about things like the MTHFR mutation. And, you know, as you, as you know, that's not a quick, easy answer. So hopefully this is a place where we can talk about that and breast cancer and your journey. Um, and so there's a lot of great information that we're going to cover today. Yay. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So tell me more about you. So I, I did a little bit of research and kind of learned about your journey with cancer um, and would love for you to share that if, if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but, you know, I'll start off with also sharing my, my nutrition journey too, right? So um, my undergraduate and graduate degrees in nutrition, and I'm a registered dietitian. And then um, at some point I decided to go back to medical school. And so I was in the middle of medical school and um, I really had no idea what I was getting into. And I kind of thought, I was gonna learn more about prevention and how the body worked and what we could do for staying well and healthy and how nutrition, you know, was there was an interplay with nutrition and health. And my medical school education took me down this whole other pathway that I didn't even realize there was, right? Like, cause I don't have any, there's no physicians in my family. So I really didn't understand all of what that training was gonna be about, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think I appreciated how much acute care medicine I was going to need to do and, you know, um, and, and, and how far it kind of took me away from some of my passions about prevention and wellness and nutrition for that matter. Um, and, but the interesting part of that whole journey in a sense was then um, somebody who was all interested in nutrition and exercise physiology and prevention. Then when I was 30, I was in the middle of my residency, I ended up getting, um, a triple negative breast cancer. So, um, uh, so it's just kind of this interesting thing. I was all, I thought I was doing everything right in terms of prevention and wellness. And, um, and, and I had no family history and back then, so this is almost 24 years ago and, you know, um, 30 is young today for breast cancer, but it was even younger back then, because unfortunately we are seeing more women getting diagnosed younger, even in their 20s, unfortunately, sometimes. But why back then it was very, very rare for somebody to be 30 and diagnosed with a breast cancer. And so I, I ended up having this triple negative breast cancer and I was in the middle of my residency and um, uh, sort of, I kind of plowed through. Um, I did a lot of, I did do some integrative stuff at the time, like acupuncture and Reiki and um, just things to sort of do some care for my body. But I ended up needing uh, chemotherapy and radiation, surgery, chemo, and then radiation. And um, I was really lucky. I, my periods went away with the treatment, but then they ended up coming back. And a few mm -hmm. months after treatment, um, I ended up getting pregnant with my daughter, who's now 23. And then a couple of years later with my son, um, I was able to breastfeed on the uh, the, the non-radiated breast, which was so important to me because I had worked for WIC as a nutritionist. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was like kind of a big passion of mine to be able to, and I was very lucky and blessed to be able to do that. And then when I kind of got through treatment and I was finishing up with my residency, it was, I was sort of hit with this, oh my goodness, I just went through this major illness and treatment and um and 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 I had to really step back and really think about what what just happened to me and um you know why did this happen and it you know and, and what was you know for thinking about prevention and wellness you know what what was I doing wrong you know as much as we can know or try to figure out like what were the things that I needed to do better um both so I didn't get cancer again if I could prevent it and then what could I do to help my patients learn what they needed to do to help prevent cancer from developing if they could or um, to decrease their risk? And so I was very, very lucky. I was blessed. I was um, I ended up getting a job at a Canyon Ranch in Lenox, Massachusetts. And um, that's where I met Kathy Swift and Mark Hyman and Todd Lapine and Cindy Geyer and 
all these people in the in this integrative world. And I went to my first um, conference for uh, with the Institute for Functional Medicine. So this was in 2004. And I um, so I went to this functional medicine conference and it just sort of was was, you know, blew me away. I was like, this is this is perfect. This is how I can sort of integrate my medical school training with my nutrition background, my belief in prevention, but also, you know, now recognizing how important, you know, tr you know, conventional medicine is and acute care medicine is and sort of bring it all together. So functional medicine really gave me that map, that, 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 um, the tools to be able to integrate it all together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so I do, I do, I practice functional medicine now in, uh, I mean, I'm board certified in family medicine, but I'm doing functional medicine in, in Lenox, Massachusetts. So yes, I, you know, that changed, it changed my life in, in this crazy way where I had to really think a little bit more and think differently about the body and how it, how it kind of all comes together and, and why we get sick and how we get well. Mm hmm Wow, that's a beautiful story. And just hearing about kind of how you've married all your different uh, schooling in terms of, you know, what you do now. And I just think that that's such a wonderful thing to have background. You know, I think there's, there's a, you know, conventional medicine, they silo you into different categories and whatnot. And this functional medicine world has really allowed people to receive such a holistic uh, treatment in terms of what their goals are. And usually that is very much either prevention or they're looking for alternatives to the way that they've been treated or how they've been received in the conventional medicine setting. So I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it taught me so much about um, just going through this myself, you know, about, um, about how to think about health and, and mm -hmm. well-being and, you know, how we want to work and how I work with each of my patients to help them create a, you know, balance in their body so their body can heal, right? And looking for yeah. what may be out of balance for that individual person. And then what do we need to do to help create balance for that individual person? And I think that's very important on anyone's healing journey um, because everybody's so different in terms of where, when they get to a diagnosis or an illness or an imbalance in they, we all come to it in a different way. And so we have, because there's different causes and different imbalances. And so we have to really unpack that and look for, for that individual person, what can we do to help them regain balance and wellness in their body? Yeah, absolutely. What I hear a lot, you know, when people receive diagnoses is oftentimes they'll show up and they'll say, I was diagnosed with lupus. What's the diet that I need to follow for lupus? Or, you know, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. What's the diet for that? And it's like, no, we have to take a step back and figure out, like you said, where the imbalance is in the body. And so I think that's a really good message for the listeners that no matter what diagnosis you've been given, there's usually a root cause that is very specific to you and how that is addressed is going to be holistic. And there's going to be some, some deeper evaluation of what's going on in your body and what systems are not functioning optimally. Yeah, that's, that was beautifully said, you know, beautifully said, I know for myself, you know, it was like, okay, I was doing a good job from the nutrition piece. I was doing a good job from the exercise piece, but you know, I wasn't doing a great job with the rest piece and mm -hmm. rest piece and the relaxation and the meditation and the calming of the body. Right. And that, and that really was very highlighted to me. Like I was like, okay, I need to do a better job here and giving my body time to rest and, mm -hmm. and, uh, sleep more and recuperate more and, and really, you know, being able to listen to my body when it needs to stop. And, um, you know, that was really, really an important piece. I, I spent a lot of time, uh, I was lucky it was in residency, but I was, I, I got a few months off. And so it was a great time where I started to journal and, um, I started to do, uh, some daily meditation and, and, um, and, and breath work. And I started to keep this gratitude journal, which really, which really shifted my, my, uh, my focus and the way I interacted with the world all around me um, um, was very, very important. And so, uh, yeah, that was that you know from a from a self care lifestyle perspective, that was the area that I really needed to focus on because I kind of was doing a pretty 
pretty good job, I think, with the with the other parts. I mean, of course, there were things I could have done better, but you know, uh, though that that's where I really focused, and that was has been uh, instrumental in terms of changing my life in such wonderful ways for the mm -hmm. you know, future. Yeah. So curious because you know, in in terms of where you were at in your life, there those things, those practices like journaling, gratitude, sleep, taking more rest, were those things that you felt like weren't going to make a big difference or were they things that you just, you know, life was kind of crazy and you didn't have a chance to prioritize them. And then after your diagnosis, you did an evaluation and said, you know, this is something that's really missing for me. Or was there certain information that you read or gained during your schooling where you realized, wow, this is actually an area that I need to put a lot more focus in? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I, I was, um, I think there's two, two things. One, I was just always a doer, right? So I was sort of in this um, uh, hamster wheel of doing, 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 right? Get this degree, then get this degree, then get this degree <laughs> and achieve, achieve. And, and, um, and so sometimes when, when that's where our mindset is, you know, I didn't really take a step back to, to think, is this really what I wanted? Or is this, is this gonna, is this gonna mesh? Um, and I, and I think that the, uh, the other thing is sometimes we tell ourselves stories, right? Like I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to rest. I'm so busy. I'm in the middle of my residency. I have to work nights. I'm in the ICU, you know, and, and so like you're, you've got all these stories going on in your head, mm -hmm. which, which for me, those stories were wearing me down and um they were exhausting right like so they the stories going on in my head were bringing me more stress so of course i had a busy life but also my my brain was making it more busy and more exhausting and mm -hmm. and and i i think i i think that um just getting the diagnosis it made me realize that that was an area i had to focus on i don't really think i had any education in at that time, uh, necessarily, I just sort of highlighted how important this was, and that I needed to rest and and pay attention to my mind. And I did a lot of reading, you know, um, I there, um, there was this great book that I read, uh, Return to Wholeness by this physician, David Simon, who worked with Deepak Chopra. And it was just, it was a lot about, you know, a mindset and, and meditation and thought processes and cancer. And so, um, and I, I, I remember I was listening to Oprah um, on TV at the time, and she talked about the gratitude journal. She had some expert on, they were talking about the gratitude journal. And it was just through taking the time to, to hear all of that, it became obvious that this was an area I needed to really focus on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true about ourselves and stress and feeling like we don't have time is so often that's just this busyness in our brain that's going and telling us these stories. And so having cancer sort of forced me to say, you know what, you can't, you can't be telling yourself these silly stories. You really got to be taking care of yourself. And it sort of, it, it made me realize, okay, this is really wearing your body down because we do know that, you know, um, the, our mindset, our uh, that that perception of stress, it can be really wear it can really wear down our immune system, and um, that was really an important area for me to focus on. Yeah, wow, and and you know a lot of people, you know, they are experiencing illness in other ways, not as extreme as cancer, right? And and I see this a lot in my practice with things like digestive issues, for example, and they're maybe getting these little whispers of, you know, you're not doing what you need to do in terms of taking care of your mental health and resting. And it was actually just talking to a client about this yesterday. It was a very relatable conversation. We talked about how, you know, you, you kind of have this like go, go, go mentality and you create this sense of urgency that actually isn't even there. And then an example of like, you complete that task, the task is done. And then you realize, oh, I didn't need to go into that with such frantic energy and like, you know, so much pressure on myself to do that. Um, so I think it, it sounds like even just the awareness of it and being aware that, you know, being inspired by your story, you know, your story was a case where, you know, you were diagnosed with life-threatening cancer. That's incredibly life-changing, but for people that 
don't have cancer, just understanding the profound impact that those habits can have um, in your overall health journey, no matter what it is, and not, not, not prioritizing them as best as we can, even though it does seem to be the first thing that falls out of our routine when life gets busy. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? And, but you know, it's different for different people too. For some people, it's, it's, it, it's the, it's the nutrition message too, right? For some people, they are like, oh, well, I don't, you know, I'm, they, they, they might know what they should be eating, but then they decide not to for all sorts of different reasons. Right. And so I think that, um, I think that's, what's can be really wonderful about not that a diagnosis is wonderful, but you know, um, an illness or a symptom in the body is it's, it's sort of waking us up to pay attention to what does the body need? And we just have to sort of quiet ourselves down enough to listen to it. And, and the body will tell us really most times really what it needs to get into better balance. That's great. I love that. You know, we, we, you know, in, in, functional medicine, we talk about, okay, how do we create this terrain in the body where cancer is less likely to grow, right? And so we know that there's, it's more than just the cancer cell that we want to pay attention to. And this is what then after my treatment, I started to learn about functional medicine and really appreciate what I could apply to myself as well as to my patients, right? But how do we create that terrain in the body where cancer is less likely to grow? And it's not like we can prevent every cancer, but there is, we have some influence um, on whether cancer grows or not. Not 100% influence, of course, but we do have some influence. And so, you know, there's um, um, a lot of things that we can do to work to rebalance the terrain in the body so it's less likely to grow cancer. So like such as lowering inflammation or lowering insulin. And, but for me, I really needed to focus on my detoxification system. So, you know, eating lots of cruciferous vegetables and, uh, every day and, um, and, uh, you know, supporting my body for sweating and my bowel movements and, and my microbiome. And those were areas that I really had to really focus on and pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Areas that I think a lot of people don't, they don't consider when they think about their cancer risk, they think, oh, you know, smoking, alcohol, maybe processed meats. Like they, they think of the more big ticket items, um, in terms of what's been headlined, but I'd like to dive in maybe just a little bit more there. I mean, from, from what I know in terms of how cancer, you know, presents itself in the body or how it gets there in the first place is there, there could be immune component, there could be genetic, there could be chronic inflammation. And so what are some of the things you mentioned detox that people should be thinking about in terms of reducing their risk of, of any type of cancer? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I pay a lot of attention to toxins and our body's ability to detoxify because we know that toxins, toxins are carcinogens in the body often, many, many toxins act as carcinogens in the body, which means that they can create abnormal cells or cancer cells and or help pr promote the progression of cancer. So there's lots of different toxins, unfortunately, in our environment, right? Everything from the um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So that will include things like the plastics, like BPA or parabens or phthalates. Um, it'll include, uh, uh, even some the forever chemicals or pesticides or herbicides. And then there's heavy metals. Um, uh, you know, there's the uh, heterosilic amines that, that occur on meats when they're really cooked very fast and grilled um, on the, you know, on the grill. Um, and so there's lots of different potential carcinogens in the environment. And so one of the things I work with everybody about is just trying to work to lower their toxic load, right? What can we do to um, avoid extra toxins from, you know, choosing organic as much as possible when you're, when you're talking about your, um, your meats, as well as your, your produce, really choosing as much organic as possible, just to lower that toxic load and, you know, storing your food in glass, you, you know, not using plastic to reheat your food and not drinking out of plastic, right? All those things that that can increase our toxic load, you know, looking for signs of heavy metal 
toxicity. So we'll measure things like mercury or lead or arsenic, right? So we'll look, at, we can look at markers of um, detoxification in the body, such as a GGT or some oxidative stress markers or glutathione markers, things that give us a sense of how is that person managing their toxic load. So it's a combination of really working to lower your toxic load and avoid as much toxins as you can, though, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of them. Um, but what, what a great example is like if we if we go from cooking, you know, from from, you know, packaged foods to cooking foods at home, you can lower your exposure to so many of these uh, plastics and and uh, forever chemicals significantly um, just by pr produce, you know, cooking your own food, which is just wonderful to know. Right. You, you do. You can really lower your exposure. Um, and choosing organic, as I mentioned. And then on the other side, we really work to support the body's ability to, to detoxify. And we, you know, our body is, is made to detoxify, right? We, we sweat, we, we detoxify when we drink enough water and we urinate, we are eliminating toxins uh, through exercise and the lymphatic system. We're moving and eliminating toxins through our bowel movements, we're eliminating toxins. So we're making sure people are getting enough fiber just to eliminate toxins. Uh, we know that the wonderful thing about polyphenols or, or phytonutrients, these components in our plant foods is they can support the body's ability to detoxify and make glutathione. So, you know, we're working on really, you know, getting in more of these cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and broccoli sprouts and cabbage and, um, Brussels sprouts and kale, right? That all support that natural detoxification in the body. And, um, and that's an area I, I focus on a lot with people that's, that's kind of a little bit outside of, like you said before, just those basics of not smoking and, 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 and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great, you know, motivator to know that we do have a lot of tools that are accessible, right? You know, increasing these types of foods in our diet that, are things we can do every day, you know, you, getting polyphenols and focusing more on berries and dark leafy greens and adding cinnamon to, you know, yeah. your coffee, even, you know, like little things that you could do on a daily basis that could give you uh, that extra support to help your body do what it was designed to do. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think another area that, you know, um, that, that we work on a lot when when we're working to decrease risk of cancer is, is insulin sensitivity, right? And balancing blood sugar, because we know, in fact, the research is really strong here that when blood sugar is high, when insulin levels are high, so that insulin is the hormone that helps bring the food into your cells so you can use it for exercise. So, and, and all the activities of daily living. So when, when you're insulin resistant, that means the insulin's not working as well and insulin levels are higher. And we know that when insulin levels are high and blood sugar is high, that that creates that terrain in the body where cancer is more likely to grow. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so doing things to balance blood sugar and lower your blood sugar and lower your insulin spike after a meal is really important. And, and we really know this makes a difference in the cancer realm. We know that hyperglycemia, so high blood sugar, high levels of insulin, create a terrain where cancer is more likely to grow. So much so that even in, even in conventional medicine, oncologists are often using medications like metformin, medications that lower insulin and lower blood sugar. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, we, it's a very well-recognized pathway that stimulates many different types of cancer, not just breast, but prostate and colon and lung and certain, some blood cancers. And so, so we know that, that, uh, that's a very important area to focus on. So doing things that improve insulin sensitivity. So, um, you know, when you have a meal, I'm sure you talk about this all the time with your followers, right? That making sure there's a good source of protein and healthy fat and fiber to, so you don't get those spikes in, in blood sugar and you don't get those spikes in insulin. And that's, that's really, really important. High fiber foods, same, same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was talking about this in group coaching the other night. Um, something that, that my husband and I really try to do is we try to go for walks after meals and that, you know, he doesn't work from home anymore, but you know, I have a walking pad in my office here. And, you know, if I'm 
I have a, a nice lunch, maybe I'll come up and do some client notes and do like a, just a nice slow steady walk. But I was telling clients, you know, if you if you have laundry to do, like save your laundry for after dinner, you can carry it up the stairs and just like moving your body too. You know, we have such a culture of sedentary lifestyle nowadays that we don't think about how even just the lack of movement around mealtime can play a role with our blood sugar levels. So that's another thing that we like we like to do. And we have a dog, so it makes it a lot easier to get out of the house because she's always, always interested in going for a walk. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Yeah, you're right that that after dinner walking is so great to prevent as much of a, you know, to help lower blood sugar and lower that insulin spike. I mean, you're right. We've, you know, our 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 daily to day lives have changed so much that we are um we are having a hard time being as active and you have to really work to be active, you know. Um mm -hmm. and and that's the same thing with lean muscle mass. Right. So we see so often that people, even if they're even if they're not overweight, though, sometimes if they're overweight, we know, OK, that they're, they have too much fat in their body that will will, especially if it's around the belly, it will drive this insulin resistance. But we also know that if you're under lean muscle mass, like so if you are low lean muscle mass, then that also can drive this insulin resistance. And um, it's a very important area that we focus on for uh, for cancer prevention, but just overall uh, health and vitality and um, is, is working to increase that lean muscle mass through, through regular exercise as well as strength training, because that makes such a difference in terms of our metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work with so many clients on this and it was actually right before you and I hopped on was on the call with my friend who is feeling anxious about the fact that, you know, her pants aren't fitting and, and we're looking at body composition here. And that's one of the things we talked about. I said, well, you've been strength training more with a personal trainer and you've gained muscle. And if we do our updated DEXA scan, we're going to see that you've gained muscle. And it, you know, it's a little bit harder to talk to women about it, you know, because we, we care so much about numbers and size and all those types of things. And, you know, I even work with, you know, CEOs who are like, oh, if I'm going to get the best bang for my buck, I got to do my cardio. You know, I, I don't have time for weights. Like I have 20 minutes and we really need to understand the, the health benefits and longevity benefits of lean muscle mass. And we're not talking like you need to be a bodybuilder and, you know, start eating 200 grams of protein per day and, you know, lifting your body weight. No, we're talking just learning how to resistance train properly so that you can improve your metabolism, reduce inflammatory markers. Like these are things that I hope our culture is starting to learn more of, but I just will, I think us keep drilling the message home that lean muscle mass is so important and it's so healthy. Absolutely. Right. It, because it is, when you have more lean muscle mass, you are more insulin sensitive. Your body mm -hmm. tends to that insulin better. And so you don't have to make as much insulin. And then that just helps break that cycle. Cause when insulin is high, it says, mm -hmm. okay, put on more weight around the belly. And then you get then that creates more inflammation and then it creates more insulin resistance and it becomes this vicious cycle. So it's a great way to break that vicious cycle is with, with exercise and strength training. Yeah. Are there specific <laughs> labs that you like to see for patients? Like if you're testing an insulin, is it like you like to see it under seven or hemoglobin A1C? Is there, are there, are there optimal ranges that you have a preference for? Cause because I know a lot of people understand now that optimal versus normal is very different when you do a blood test for conventional medicine for something like this. Absolutely. So, and there's no, there's often no perfect test. So it's important that we take each blood marker in, in with the whole person's story and their picture and their, uh, their vital signs and their waist hip ratio. And um, because sometimes it, one blood marker or two don't give us the whole picture, but mm -hmm. yeah, in general, like I, I do fasting insulin all the time. I, I like it around five or like you said, less than seven. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we, I definitely don't want it over 10. Uh, and most conventional literature will say greater than 12 is considered insulin resistant. So that's for a fasting insulin level. Mm -hmm. So, um, it does move around a lot. So, you know, you want to look at you know, one high number might not is don't, don't, you know, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Okay. Um, definitely check hemoglobin A1C. It's also not a perfect 
marker. I mean, there's some people it's where it's not a good marker for them, but that tells us about your blood sugar over the last three months, right? So I'll like that 5.5 or, or a little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. if, um, and you also get a lot of clues about insulin resistance based on somebody's waist to hip ratio. So mm -hmm. I love, you know, we test everybody's waist to hip ratio in our office when they come in and, you know, look at your, your waist circumference and then, uh, um, and then divide it by your hip circumference. And for women, you want to be 0.8 or less. Um, and at, at least, and, and so that's really can give you feedback on is there signs of insulin resistance? Um, and you also get a lot of signs on things like a C-reactive protein, which is a, a marker for inflammation. You want that to be low. And on somebody's cholesterol levels, you can get a lot of information. Is this person more prone to insulin resistance? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you can, you can look at to give you a, a, a sense. But really for all of us, we're always working to improve our insulin sensitivity is a great place to focus because in having better insulin sensitivity is, is really great for decreasing risk of dementia, for decreasing risk of heart disease, for, and then of course, as we've been talking about for cancer. So it's really a wonderful area of like, okay, I'm gonna focus on improving insulin sensitivity. And that really gets into all the good stuff with diet and, and exercise and lean muscle mass that we've been talking about, but also everything like um, getting enough sleep, um, you know, not eating too late in the evening, um, and, uh, and, and then even things like avoiding certain toxins, like they, they've seen, there's been studies that have shown that BPA, right. That plastic that we know is not good in terms of its endocrine disrupting capability. So it's been associated with cancer, breast cancer, but other, you know, other things as well. It's also been associated with insulin resistance. And mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of studies looking at toxins and insulin resistance too. So, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Do you ever use uh, continuous glucose monitors in your practice or find them to be useful with the types of patients that you're working with? Yeah. So continuous glucose monitors, we use them. We do use them in our practice and I find that they can be helpful uh, many times. So sometimes they help people realize that the meal composition they put together was not the best choice. Like they thought they were doing a good job at um, balancing their blood sugar, but they're, but then they see a higher spike than they, they realize, And that helps them go, okay, maybe that was too much fruit at that meal, for example, mm -hmm. but they're not, but continuous glucose monitors are not perfect because there are some people who have high levels of insulin resistance, meaning they're producing so much insulin, even their blood sugar might, might look fine, but they're producing a lot of insulin to keep that blood sugar fine. And mm -hmm. so, so it, it's not a, it's not perfect for everyone. Um, and then the other thing I, I sometimes see the other negative of continuous glucose monitors for some people is for, for some people, it just creates too much of a focus, right? And then they're they're just extra focused on their their food, and that's not always helpful. And so, you know, we've got to be a little careful about that too. But yeah, we do use them. What do you think? I I like them. I I hundred percent agree with you. I think they are they're not something that I jump to as a first line of data for any patient. Um, I wore one myself for a month, and it was one of those things where it's like this is great. I'm going to learn some things about my body for a month. I'm going to look at how exercise impacts my blood sugar, stress, sleep, certain meals, even, even going longer periods of time without a meal. Um, you know, those types of things. And then it was like, okay, now I'm, that's not going to be the main thing that I focus on. And I, and I do the same with clients, you know, it, I'm particularly working with one client right now where she's been experiencing a lot of symptoms of blood sugar imbalance and, She's doing all the things, diet, doing all the things, um, exercise wise, she's sleeping, she's working on stress reduction. And so this is kind of one last thing for us to explore out, out of her curiosity because of her symptoms. We've looked at insulin, we've looked at gut health, you know, all that stuff. And, and actually the gut health side of things was a huge contributor to why she hasn't been feeling good. She has, you know, really bad yeast overgrowth in the body that's been going on long-term, but it's a great tool. I think it's a great tool. I would agree with everything that you said about it. And, um, you know, there's just, there's so much variation. I don't think it needs to be a long-term device that people are using to, to micromanage their lifestyle. 
Right, right. No, that's a that's a great point. It's a great summary. Yeah. So I'd love to chat about the MTHFR gene, you know, conversation because I way back in my gut healing journey, I worked with um, a functional medicine practitioner like yourself. It totally changed my life. It inspired me to go into um, you know, dietetics and just learn about how nutrition impacts our body. And I did this genetic test and I learned I had one of the gene mutations for it. And so I was, you know, doing my research at the time and, and just learning about it. But, you know, this, this is something that I didn't realize how important it was for overall health and how many areas of our health it impacts from, you know, cardiovascular disease to, you know, potentially cancer risk and detoxification. And so I'd love to just dive in a little bit. I know it's probably hard to give like a short summary of, you know, MTHFR, this conversation in general, but, you know, how does this impact our overall health? And, you know, should someone be concerned if they have one of the mutations versus two? Um, should we all be supplementing with methylated vitamins? So I'd love to cover some of those topics. That's it's, okay. Great. I, I love the topic, you know, so, um, so one of the things that I find helpful is just distinguishing uh, some of the, the words around genetics, right? So um, uh, MTHFR is a, a, is considered a low penetrance gene, which what that means is that it, um, it, there's more people who have variations in it and it impacts our health, but it's not in the same category of some of those high penetrance genes. And so, you know, give an example of a high penetrance gene that would be like BRCA, the BRCA gene. And so when people have the variation in their, in their, in their BRCA gene, right, their risk of breast cancer goes up significantly from like 12% lifetime risk to somewhere between 40 to even 80% lifetime risk of breast cancer, for example. That's considered a high penetrance gene, meaning that it, it, it impacts your risk of cancer in a, in a strong way, high penetrance. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the low penetrance genes out there, and we're just learning more and more and more about, about how they impact our health. And so MTHFR is, is one of them. And uh, we've, there's been a lot of really interesting research on this gene and how it impacts who we are. And so it's a gene that encodes for this um, enzyme called the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. And this is an enzyme that activates folate. So it, 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 it allows for folate to be used to, um, produce many different proteins in the body. So for example, it will convert homocysteine to methionine. And then, then uh, you need that to make many different proteins in the body, such as your neurotransmitters like serotonin and things that impact your mood and your focus and your attention. And so, um, yes, there's been a lot of research looking at the different, uh, uh, the impact of this MTHFR gene. And so there's different types of MTHFR genes. So some of the ones that have been studied the most is the C677T and the A1298C. And you were mentioning before, you can have one copy or two copies. So let me just back up for a second. So we think that about 60 to 70% of the population has one copy of, or one variant of this gene. So you get one allele from your mom and you get one allele from your dad. And, um, and then that's considered your, your, your gene. And if, if one of the alleles has a variation in it, then that's considered your heterozygous. You have one variation in that one gene. If you're both the allele from your mom and your dad has a variation, then you're considered homozygous. You have uh, there's a variation in both of the alleles of that gene. And so what we know when you have a heterozygous variation, it, um, it has less of an impact over your overall health than if you have a homozygous variation. So as I said, we think that about 60 to 70% of the population has at least one variant in one of the MTHFR genes. So it's very common. Um, and about 10 to 20% of the population, depending on 
which uh, which population we're looking at uh, have a homozygous variation in one of their MTHFR genes. So that means that they have both alleles have a variation in it, um, or they might be considered compound heterozygous, meaning they have one variation in both of the MTHFR genes that we're looking at. Why that matters is that if you are heterozygous, the more common thing is that there's a there's a 30% or so decreased efficacy or of that enzyme that it brings folate into the, the these pathways to be used to make proteins. Um, and then if you have, if you are homozygous, then it's a much more significant decrease in that enzyme. So about a 70% decrease in that act in that MTHFR in the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme activity. And so, so it impacts people differently. People who have just one variation, there may not be any much impact at all, but people who have the homozygous variation, there may be more of an impact in terms of their health. And as you mentioned, it variations in this gene have been associated with everything from cardiovascular disease and stroke, increased blood clotting, um, uh, mis increased miscarriage, uh, increased uh, neural tube defects, um, cleft palate, for example, um, diff more increased risk of neuropathy. And then of course, from the mood perspective, increased risk of depression and increased risk of fatigue. And mm -hmm. so it's a gene that we're looking at all the time. And so what when we do see somebody with this variation, we say, well, you want your B vitamins, you want, you might need more B vitamins, for example, you may need more folate, both from your diet and maybe a supplement. And the, the folate you want is in the methylated form, because then you don't have to make that conversion. It's, it's activated already and the body can just utilize it right away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. um, you know, so the thing that I will you mentioned that you asked this question at the beginning, you're like, well, should everybody just be on a methylated form of folate? And, and I pretty much say yes. I mean, the, the, um, the synthetic form of folate is folic acid and people with this variation can't utilize the folic acid as well to, to um, do all these processes in the body. So I, you know, if you don't know your MTHFR gene status, you might as well have a methylfolate form in your in your supplement. And um, I definitely think for pregnant women, you might as well choose a prenatal that has methylfolate in it because we know it's that it's that methylfolate. It's the folate that decreases risk of of uh, neural tube defects, and that's why there's such an emphasis on folate in our prenatal vitamins and why you wanna start taking them three months before you get pregnant. Um, most of the folate in your plant foods, so folate comes from your foliage, your green leafy veggies, um, your spinach and all the kale and all your green leafy veggies. And you know most of that is naturally in the methylated form. So it's easy for the body to assimilate and utilize it. It's just that synthetic folic acid that, that is hard for some people to, to utilize. Mm -hmm. This, this is, you've done such an amazing job summarizing all of this. Uh, you know, I think it, people get so fixated on, oh, I, I, if I have any of these, you know, gene variations, I'm destined to be on glutathione for the rest of my life. And I need to do all these things, you know, and, and so it's, it's helpful for you to reiterate the fact that this is not like a death sentence that there, you just need to take a look at everything going on. You know, I would imagine looking at your folate levels and homocysteine levels and inflammation and, you know, all these markers that you've also talked about here that could tell us about detox and look at the person's overall risk, um, symptoms, things like that. Like for me, you know, mental health is a big, there's a big genetic component there for me in terms of family history and, you know, definitely seeing issues with detox down my family line. And so, it's an area where I've always supplemented with the, the methylated vitamins. And I've, I always encourage patients to just use the methylated vitamins as well. And so it's nice to hear that that's something that, that you would recommend as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, you know, um, what it is important, like you said, you know, we can look at things like homocysteine because homocysteine is protein that's floating around in the blood and it needs folate and B6 
and B12 to get broken down. So if homocysteine levels are too high, I like them around eight, but definitely, you know, greater than 10 or, or you know, if, the higher it gets, it means your body is, doesn't have enough, whether it's because of genetics or intake, um, it doesn't have enough of those B vitamins to break it down. And so um, that's a great biomarker to look at to say, okay, if my homocysteine's 13, I need more methylated B vitamins. Um, am I going to get it from a food source or a supplement source or a combination to help bring that homocysteine down? Mm -hmm. um, but, but sometimes the homocysteine's normal, but people still have some, some symptoms. And when we check their MTHFR, we realize, you know, there's some variations here and maybe somebody's struggling with fatigue or depression, and we might just give higher doses of, of, you know, especially methylfolate or depending on the situation, may, maybe a combination, combination, but just to help with energy and mood and, um, it can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's an, it's a really an in, very interesting area and, um, an area that we can have a lot of impact on. Um, we know that, uh, uh you know, I always see this gene getting more expressed when people go to college, right? So what happens, you go to college. So you're not necessarily eating the, all of the vegetables your parents were feeding you when you were at home and you go off to college and maybe you're not, your diet's not as good. And then you're drinking more alcohol. I mean, this is a, I'm just giving you a, a very, um, stereotypical picture, but, but that happens a lot. People, kids go off to college, they drink a lot more alcohol. They're not eating their vegetables and, and they start to get more fatigue or depression. And so uh, we can see that gene express itself around that time. So when you're not getting enough of your, your folate from your green leafy veggies, and then you're, you're drinking a lot of alcohol, alcohol uses up all those B vitamins. And so you become more, more at risk for those side effects, especially if you're genetically predisposed. And so, you know, many times, you know, I think that's what's so interesting about genes, you know, people will be like, well, I've, I've always had this MTHFR variation. Why is it impacting me now? Right. So it, it may be, you know, more alcohol intake or a toxin exposure or an excessive stress or some, you know, things or de change in the way that of what foods you're eating or what you're absorbing and all of these things we have to take together to determine what that person needs. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's, that's well said and, and so empowering. I think it, I, I'm particularly, I was very motivated by the mental health side of things. My father was bipolar and schizophrenic and I always struggled with anxiety and depression. And so just understanding that risk, you know, luckily when I got to college, I was not a big drinker. I was, I actually did a lot of that in my high school days. I'm not very proud of that, but I kind of had my little wild child you know, episodes then. And so I started actually taking better care of myself and working on detox pathways and fixing my gut health. And lo and behold, you know, a lot of my anxiety symptoms, depression really worked their way out into a place where I, I no longer needed medication. And that was just amazing to see. And I, I was the dietitian for a drug and alcohol facility out in California. And just the link between mental health and, you know, some of the, the nutrition factors and, and also these lab values is, is really powerful. And, you know, I'm, I'm love, I love looking at the research and like continuing to see how, you know, these different relationships are, are intertwined. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, there's so much that we can do for our mental health when it comes to better supplementation, better diet, um, better self-care, right? You know, um, it, it can be really impactful. In fact, they know, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of research on when people have depression, if they have this MTHFR variation, some of the medications don't work as well, like the SSRIs, right? But if you add, if you layer in methylfolate with it, and I use supplement form all the time, but there is actually a prescription form of methylfolate folate called Deplin. And when they add that to an antidepressant, the medication works so much better. Wow. So, is it the medication that's working better? Or is it just, just because you're on methylfolate, but it allows the body to produce more serotonin and, and then, you know, that it helps with the, uh, you know, improving depression symptoms significantly. So wow. um, it's really an important area for us to look at and pay attention to. That's incredible. 
So I know we don't have much time here. And if you don't mind, I'd love to just briefly touch on the topic of hyperactivity, ADD, ADHD, uh, because it, this is an area that I've seen so many individuals being thrown prescriptions for. And I was actually on medication for ADD for several years. Um, and, and I really, it, it just took a toll on my body, my mental health, my physical health, like totally depleted my minerals. I mean, talk about not knowing how to rest, being on stimulants. It was, it was a huge part of my health journey. So I'm very passionate about it and, you know, would love to maybe just briefly touch on some of the root causes of, you know, hyperactivity, ADHD, ADD, and maybe how you approach it in your practice. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we do look at a lot of genetic variations here. Um, you know, there's a lot we know about um, and a lot we don't know about. So in addition to MTHFR, we'll look at things like a COMT and, um, and some of the dopamine receptor genes. And that can kind of give us a sense of where uh, ADHD may be coming from a, a little bit from a genetic perspective. You know, we know that there is, you know, there's different different thoughts about where ADHD come from, come, is coming from, but, um, you know, there's, you know, that lack or not having enough dopamine or the dopamine not staying around long enough can, can be a reason for some people to have problems with attention and focus. And, and, you know, on the other hand, some people have their dopamine stays around too long and then they have an issue with over-focus and anxiety, right? So it's it just an interesting thing that we're looking at all the time when it comes to genetics and the methylated B vitamins can be really helpful here as well. Um, we, I also always am measuring things like, um, the gluteomorphins and caseomorphins. These are these components from gluten and dairy that can cross the blood brain barrier and impact things like our mood and our focus and our attention. So for some people, if they have these gluteomorphins or caseomorphins uh, or, and, or if we just remove gluten and dairy, we can see some substantial improvements in focus and attention, um, not for everybody, but for some people. Um, and, the, and the other area we really focus on a lot is, is a lot of the lifestyle stuff, right? So really working with people to balance blood sugar. So we, just, we were talking about that before with insulin resistance, but it's also important here, you know, making sure that every meal you have a really good protein source and healthy fats and lots of fiber. So you have a more steady blood sugar, which really helps with focus and attention. So often people aren't getting enough if they're not getting enough protein at a meal, for example, or, um, you know, I mean, I always, I always talk about like, in you know, uh, you know, we, we were used to eating like pancakes and syrup and orange juice. Right. And, and, and then afterwards you get this headache and you couldn't focus and, you know, because your blood sugar was going up and down. So really focusing on really, you know, things that help keep your blood sugar more balanced, making sure somebody's getting enough sleep, getting enough of those omega threes. Omega three fats are the are really anti inflammatory, and they're really necessary for for um, brain health. and um, And so we're always measuring things like somebody's omega three levels, which is called an omega three index, and making sure that person is getting sufficient omega threes in their diet for brain health and its anti inflammatory component. And so, you know, your omega threes are coming from fish and fish oil and ground flaxseed and walnuts. And, um, and then I also am always looking at things like, okay, getting somebody off of any food additives and food coloring for some people that makes a huge difference in terms of their focus and their attention and how well they feel. So those are just some areas that we know make a, can make a big difference for people. Yeah. I mean, for me, I know around the time when I was coming off of my medications, it was incredibly challenging, um, you know, just to rebalance my entire body. And, and one of the things that I did remove was gluten and that it was like night and day, you know, it was, and I hear this a lot from clients, if they do have a, a strong sensitivity to gluten, this is celiac aside, you know, they'll, they'll say, I, I have brain fog. It's hard to focus throughout the day. I just like feel, I feel foggy. That's one of the number one things that I'll hear. And oftentimes that's a good sign that that, that is playing a huge role in their, in their, you know, body's reactivity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any 
knowledge of the long-term effects of things, you know, the stimulant uses, you know, things like the amphetamines, um, you know, for these types of conditions, I honestly haven't, I don't know that I would, I would, um, I would say I've done a deep dive into the research, but just in terms of like working with patients and gut health and appetite and things like that, I, I mean, I can see, see some of these smaller anecdotal impacts in my practice, but is there anything that you've seen that would concern you for the use of these types of medications, other than the fact that, you know, there could be other underlying things going on that aren't being addressed that obviously should from a diet and lifestyle perspective. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that I worry about with long-term stimulant use is just some of the imbalances we see in neurotransmitters over time. So, um, and, and what we do see, and this has been well-documented in the literature, is that uh, serotonin levels are decreased. And so people are at a higher risk of depression over time. And so, um, and so when, when we're working to support dopamine so strongly, things can get out of balance. And so, um, and we see these, we, we see more depression. And so then sometimes, okay, what do you need to do if that person is going to stay on a stimulant for whatever reason, do you need to support with things like 5-HTP or tryptophan or do they need an antidepressant? Um, and we see this with kids a lot. You know, I mean, I think we have been in the past so quick to prescribe stimul stimulant medication. And for some kids, they're life changing, but you know, we obviously were way over prescribing it. And so there's a, a, a lot of, you know, a, a huge chunk of kids where, where we really just should be working on lifestyle improvement. And, um, and, and because, because, because the, because of course the medication has side effects, mm -hmm. you know, and you mentioned appetite, you know, not being able to put on enough weight, you know, uh, I, I mean, of course, then what does that mean in terms of that, especially if it's a young person who's still growing, what does that mean in terms of their nutritional intake? And then, you know, there could be so many long-term or, or, you know, short-term sequela because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I needed to use a lot of tools to come off of that medication. My, I really started working out in a healthier way and resting more and, you know, using adaptogens like ashwagandha really helped me personally. So there were a lot of things that I, I did to be able to come off of that. Uh, I really didn't think it was possible. Like it was, I was so dependent on it. It was really helping me get through my day to day. So my heart goes out to anybody that you know, is struggling with those types of things. But yeah, the, the childhood side of things is what it saddens me because, you know, these kids, and I'm, I'm not a parent yet, but, you know, it's probably hard as a parent, you know, you, your, your kid might be a picky eater, or it might be hard to, you know, control all these lifestyle factors, but just understanding that they are powerful and that they can have an impact, hopefully will just um, enlighten people to not jump to, this as a, a first line option if, if there's other things we can try to help support that little growing human body. A hundred percent. And I, I also want to give a plug to neurofeedback. I find that for so many of my patients who uh, go through neurofeedback, which is this process of you do these exercises with getting feedback from an EEG wave and it, you know, there's at least 40 sessions involved. It's not a, it's not a quick fix, but I've had a lot of really good, uh, really, really good improvements in people with doing neurofeedback as well. I've never tried it and I've been very interested in it. So it's something I'm going to have to put on my list because it sounds like something I would greatly benefit from. Yeah. It's I've, I've had so much good feedback. So Great. That's cool. Well, is there anything else that you feel passionate about that you feel like you didn't get a chance to chat about today? I know I've, I've gotten you a little over time here. I could honestly pick your brain all day. Um, no, I think we, I, I think we hit on so many great topics and I love how you just summed it up there at the end saying, you know, just to realize how much these lifestyle factors can really have a great impact on our health. And, you know, sometimes it seems overwhelming, but even small little steps can make a big difference. You know, getting, getting a kid, if we're going to go back to the AD, ADD, you know, getting them off of food coloring and getting them off of additives and getting onto whole foods can make a huge difference for how we feel and how our, how we experience life on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So much, so much gratitude for your messages today, Elizabeth, and, and all the information that you have and all the work that you're doing to help people from, from all your, your experiences and knowledge that you've gained over the years. So where can people find you if they're interested in working with you? I know you do virtual and in practice, in practice. Yeah. So I work at the ultra wellness center and so ultra wellness center.com and, um, uh, uh, and then I also, my other website is my personal website, drboham.com. And um, um, I have a free ebook on my website that kind of goes through uh, the functional medicine approach to breast cancer. So, you know, some information there that we touched on today. Um, and then I, on Facebook and Instagram, I'm Elizabeth Boham, MD. So amazing. Well, everyone go, go stay in touch with her. She's got amazing resources in out there in the world and she's a wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for coming on today and sharing it with our listeners.